working our way through theology, which is the study of God. And theology is, there's two things. Theology is the whole series of doctrines of theology, like, you know, we study bibliology. Now we're studying theology proper, which means the study of God. And then there's, you know, anthropology, study of man, Christology, the study of Christ, soteriology, the study of salvation, etc. So we're going to be working our way through that. <clears throat> so today we're still on the topic of theology. Last week we looked at the attributes of God. Obviously we only scra scratched the surface because there's uh, so much to God. He's infinite, right? It's going to take all eternity to, to, to discover who he is. So what we're going to do today and, and next week is we're going to study the essential works of God. Who God is is the attributes and what he does. Those are his works. So we're going to look at God as ruler. We're going to look at God as redeemer. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time in God as redeemer because when we get to salvation, and obviously we'll spend a lot more time on it there. <clears throat> and God in the end times. And again, we'll just touch the surface tonight because when we get to eschatology down the road, we'll study a whole lot more on that. And then we're going to look at what God has made. In other words, creation. So we'll spend some time tonight looking at that and next Sunday as well. God rules. God is the ruler of the universe. Sometimes it appears that Satan is winning the, uh, the game or the war, but God is the ultimate uh, ruler. He oversees everything. Chaos doesn't reign. There is order to God's universe. That should give us great confidence. It give us great Confidence in the fact that God is in full and absolute control of his creation. He rules as the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. Let's just look at a few verses here on that. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Deuteronomy was the last book in the Torah where, God, where Moses was instructing the Israelites just before they were entering into the promised land. It says in verse 15, For the, the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great and mighty the awesome God who does not show partiality. Isn't that nice to know that? He doesn't show partiality. He doesn't say to someone, oh, you know, favor you more because I like you more. No, God does not show partiality. He doesn't take a bribe. So God demonstrates his rule in a variety of ways. He intervenes in nature. He also intervenes in history. For example, he decides by calling certain individuals and nations to a particular purpose of his own choosing. He chose Abraham, and choosing Abraham, then he <clears throat> promised that from his loins there would be a nation, and he would choose that nation to be, to be the, uh, the nation through which he works out his purposes, and be the nation of Israel. He decides, his own, according to his own sovereign will. Causes things to happen, causes things to happen, commands events into existence. I like this verse here in Romans 4, 17 says that, let's go to the second half, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. This is the God that rules the universe. He calls into being that which does not exist. In fact, I think there's even Psalm 147 alludes to that. Let me just go there, Psalm 147, verse 15. He sends forth his command to the earth, and his word runs very swiftly. There's another verse in, in the Psalms. It says he, he, he speaks, and it stands firm. <clears throat> he commands victories. So he commands events into existence. He also commands ex nihilo, which means it's a, it's a Latin term. Nihilo means nothing. Ex means out of. He commands out of nothing which means by the word of his power, he brings things into existence from absolutely nothing. So here there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was something because he spoke it into existence. At creation, we see that perfectly. Not only does he create out of nothing, he also maintains his universe by the same word of his power. So the same power that he exercised to bring into existence that which did not exist, that same power sustains this universe. If he were to remove his power, this universe would just, just go into chaos. So even the fact that the universe remains orderly, even the fact that there's order in creation is because, not only because he created order, but he also sustains it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. 
Okay, maybe someone can read that for us. And then another one is Colossians 1.17. Someone else can read that for us. Hebrews 1.3. Okay, so upholds all things by the word of his power. What about Colossians 1.17? Does someone have that for us? And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So in him all things consist. My translation, it says in him all things hold together. It's a, you can translate it uh, that way as well, or all things endure. And so it just shows that if God was to remove his hand, his power, then this whole thing would just explode. There'd be nothing left. So as, a, as the rule of the universe, and according to the counsel of his own independent will, he permits some things to take place. We talked about this last week. He permits some events to take place. Right? He permits sickness, for example. He allows COVID, for example. He permits certain things to take place. But he also prevents other things from happening. I remember, I might have shared this with you one time, but <clears throat> when I was um, leaving Ontario to move to Edmonton, so I was going to, you know, I got accepted to the University of Alberta, so I was moving here. My parents were living here as well. That's why I chose to go to U of A. <clears throat> so I had, I had this little small Honda, one of those little Civics, like 1976 thing. It was one of the first ones. Packed full of all my possessions. Could fit all my possessions in a small little Honda Civic. That's how much possessions I had at the time. But anyway, it was significant. So I, I decided to go through the U.S. rather than, you know, in the Canada. I don't know why I wanted to do a different route or something like that. Anyway, so I'm, I'm in Michigan somewhere. I can't remember where, but, you know, northern part of Michigan. And I, uh, <clears throat> I stopped for some gas. And then I also, then I parked my car at this gas station. Also, I had a little restaurant, so I went in there for a burger. And I remember getting out of my car to go into the restaurant. And there was these two guys that were just watering around there or whatever, right? They were just there. And I, I just remembered that, those two guys. So I went into the restaurant, had my burger, and I come out. And then one of the guys came to me and says, hey, hey, buddy, can you give me a ride? I, I, I just need to go down the road, a little ways to you know, visit my mother or something like that. And just, it's only about two miles down the road. I said, sure, get in the car. So gets in the car and we're going down the road. And I says, oh, no, no, you got to turn here. And I look at her, turn there. It's like this weird road that was going into a wooded area. And I'm thinking, I don't think you're, there's no one living in there. So I said to him, I said, listen, if you want to go down the highway, I'll take you down there two hours or two miles. But if you're taking me in here, you're getting out. <laughs> So I let him out, turn around, and then it suddenly occurred to me, there was two guys, and here was only one. And I think, I can't prove this, but I think they were plotting something. They saw my plates were from Ontario, and the other guy was probably in the woods hiding out. Like, is that like a conspiracy theory? Well, you never know. <laughs> it would qualify as a conspiracy theory, but you know, I, I was thinking about it, and I'm just praising God for preventing a potential problem. I mean, no one would have known. It would have been an uns unsolved crime. How did you fit into your car when it was so cold? Well, I still had the passenger seat was still empty. <laughs> but I just, I just had a weird feeling that this guy's telling me to go into this wooded area and there was two guys and I was only one. Where's the other guy? So, thank God. Anyway, that, that's just a side issue here. Just to say that God allows certain things to happen and he also prevents other things from happening. God also, not only is he, he rules, you know, a sovereign over the universe, he also rules as judge. In that sense, he, he judges unrighteousness, rewards righteousness. God does reward obedience, and he does punish disobedience. So he also rules as judge. So and that's one of his works, is God as ruler. The second is God as redeemer. And so the work of God is clearly seen in the redemption of humanity. So there's obviously, we know that God is a plur, has a plurality. We talked about this a little bit in the past. There is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're distinct, but one, distinct persons, one God and three distinct persons. 
And again, we cannot solve that mystery, but that we do know the Bible teaches that the Father is the sender. Okay, so he sends the Son. So let's look at that, John 20, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So the Father is the sender, and the Son is the Savior. He saves us from our sins by the work of atonement that he's accomplished. And the Spirit is the sanctifier. The Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies us so that we become more and more conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. So the Father sends, the Son saves, and the Spirit sanctifies. That's sort of the, the role of each member of the Trinity. So as I said, redemption will be discussed in greater detail when we cover the topic of sin and salvation, which is probably the next topic once you get through this one. Man, sin, and salvation. Suffice it to say that God wills our redemption by predetermining our destiny. He wills our redemption to be totally conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus. That's our destiny, to be conformed into his image. And so that's God as redeemer. Okay, we're just going to move onward because those topics, again, we will discuss in further detail when we get to man's sin and salvation. Now, God in the end time as well. God is also the God of history. So although in this present age, God's reign is challenged by the principalities of evil, but obviously there, there are no contests for God. Satan is not equal to God in power or in anything for that matter, <clears throat> but he certainly is more powerful than us. This is why we must always put on the armor of God because there's no way we can battle Satan in our own flesh. But God's reign is challenged by the principality of evils, but a time is coming when his reign will be unchallenged. At that time, the current universe will pass away. This is in Revelation chapter 21. We read about that. There's also, we talked about this last week, the millennial reign where Jesus will reign as the king of this world. He'll reign from Jerusalem on a physical throne of David. But we do learn from Revelation chapter 20 that at the end of a thousand years, his reign is challenged. There's a massive deception. Satan is released for a seven year and his, his reign is challenged. It goes unchallenged prior to that, but certainly at the end of the millennium, it does go challenged. But then when he creates a new heavens and a new earth, in Revelation 21, there will be no challenge to his rule. Not only will humans be redeemed, all things will be redeemed. All things in heaven and all things on earth. And then the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, will put all things in subjection under the rule of God. Even Jesus himself will be in subjection to the Father. So that's at the very end of time. So God is our future and our ultimate hope. Revelation 21 says this, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, just like in the Garden of Eden before the fall. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. We'll be able to just talk with God without any fear. He will it'll just be total harmony. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there'll be no longer any death. There'll be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. That's our ultimate, ultimate hope. So again, that happens after the thousand year reign. As I mentioned last week, there's three periods. Well, it's probably more than three periods, but we're in the church age. And then after the church age, when Jesus returns physically, then we'll be in the millennial age. And then after the 1000 year reign of Christ, then we enter into the eternal new heavens, new earth age in, in Revelation 21. And again, we will look at that in far more detail when we get to that topic of eschatology. I don't know when that'll happen, but probably by then we'll be in 2022. So now what we want to do, though, is we want to look at what God has made. We're going to spend a bit of time on this one. This is that 
you know, the, the, it's, it's always a controversy as to, uh, you know, how did he go about it? Was it a millions upon millions of years, billions of years, or was it pretty short period of time, like six days, etc.? Well, you know, it's really interesting. <clears throat> this goes to show what, what's important in, in different cultures. A Chinese paleontologist, and paleontologist one who studies fossils, uh, lectures around the world saying that, that recent fossil finds in this country are inconsistent with the Darwinian theory of evolution. Ooh, that's pretty controversial. I bet you Twitter would ban that one. <laughs> Probably if that was on YouTube, YouTube would just, you know, censor it. <clears throat> His reason is because the, this is a true story. The, the, the major animal groups appear abruptly in the, in the rocks over a relatively short period of time. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. All of a sudden, bango, there's all this massive diversity of, of, of living organs. Well, there were fossil organisms, but living at, when, at the time. And so this goes totally against the evolutionary theory. Rather than evolving gradually from a common ancestor, as, as Darwin's theory predicts. And then, when his conclusion upsets American scientists, how dare you say that? That Darwin's theory of evolution is, is, not, uh, is, is debated. The Chinese paleontologist says, you know, in China, we can criticize Darwin, but not the government. But here in America, you can criticize the government, but not Darwin. And there's some truth to that, isn't it? Right? I mean, man, you, you, you know, there, there's, there, there, there are scientists, academics. I mean, one guy's got four PhDs. And all he was talking about in his class was that the Darwinian theory doesn't explain everything about biological origins. He wasn't even a creationist. I don't even think I was a Christian. He was just saying, we have to consider the possibility of an intelligent designer. Got fired. You know, because he brought in the possibility, that's all he said, of an intelligent designer. Well, that went against the theory of, you know, the, the narrative, and so and they fired the guy. And this happens all the time. In fact, there's an interesting uh, DVD that, if you ever want to watch it, if you have any DVD players, I don't have any more because the computers don't give the DVD, DVD drives anymore, but, or the laptops. It's called um, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, by Ben Stein. And basically what he does is he goes around to different profs, different academics, who believe in the possibility of intelligent design, and they talk about how they're ostracized. They're prevented from from promotions, from tenure in universities, because they happen to say uh, that there is a possibility of an intelligent desire. So again, you can criticize the government all you want, but God forbid you should criticize the Darwinian theory. We're gonna, uh, before we delve into the debate over origins, I want us to review how the Genesis account has been interpreted in the past, okay? So this is where we find out that God, how, how God created is in Genesis 1, and. Genesis 2, and then we find out how the fall happened in Genesis 3. There's basically um, <clears throat> three ways that Genesis, three major categorical ways that Genesis has been interpreted. So we're going to look at those. And then one thing I want us to look at, which is, I think, a very important thing to look at. And that is, what actually is the type of literary genre used to describe a creation account. Because as we know, the literary genre, the type of literature, the type of grammar uh, used in the scripture determines to a large extent how you're gonna interpret that scripture. So for example, we inter interpret Proverbs differently than we would interpret the Gospels, or we interpret the Psalms a little differently than we would interpret Joshua. <clears throat> It's all true, it just has different literary types. So we're gonna look at that. For example, the, the, the main consensus among uh, evangelicals who don't believe in the creation account would say that Genesis chapter one to Genesis two, chapter two verses three was written in poetic language, in figurative language, and therefore it's not meant to be taken literally. So the question is, is that true? Is it poetic language? Is it figurative language? We're gonna look at that. Because if it isn't, then that's a, that's a game changer. 
<clears throat> so the type of genre will determine how we interpret the Genesis account of origin. So let's start with the three, uh, the three general views. So throughout history, especially now with the advent of modern science, there's been a lot of discussion, debate over the meaning of Genesis 1 and 2. So three distinct generalized views come up. <clears throat> the first one is it's a myth. Okay, yeah, just a, an ancient creation account. There was a whole bunch going on around that time. This just happened to be one among several. <clears throat> so, you know, Genesis, you know, you always hear the, 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 the statement, uh, <clears throat> the Bible is not a science book. It's not a, text, it's not a science textbook. Well, who, whoever said it was anyway to begin with. I mean, no one ever says that the Bible is a science book. But anyway, they say because the Bible is not a science book, it, it, it doesn't have any, 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 any influence in matters of science. So Genesis is just one of the many mythical accounts about our origins written in the distant past. So for, for example, there's a, a Babylonian story called the Gilgamesh, which if you read it, it has some similar similar, you know, symbolism and stuff like that to the creation account. So what the, the argument goes was the Hebrews borrowed that and just made it into a monotheistic account. But it's still a myth in, in, in their minds. This view obviously doesn't recognize the creation story in Genesis and inspired an and inerrant account of origins. I mean, I remember hearing one uh, evangelical uh, academic lives in right here in Edmonton or in Edmonton and he's quite well known in his, he gives talks about this and <clears throat> I remember going to one of his talks and he says, yeah, the, the way it goes, it's just like, uh, you know, God was talking baby talk to us. He was just kind of, you know, we wouldn't be able to understand how he did it. So he just kind of, you know, gives us a sort of a, the Dr. Seuss version or the, you know, the baby, the, the child's book version of it. That was, you know, what he said. So then that's one, is that it's totally myth. The second, and this is probably the most common one for those uh, evangelicals who do not believe in a six-day creation, that the creation account is figurative. Okay, it's figurative language, it's poetic language, and uh, it's a form of poetry, it's figurative history and not literal history. So because it's figurative language, we don't take it literally. It's just a way of expressing that God created. I mean, well, you know, the, the, the important matter is that God created. It doesn't matter whether it's six days or six million years or six billion years. The important thing is that God created. That's, that, that's kind of how the argument goes. The Genesis account may convey a sense of truth about our origins, but it is certainly not a literal description of actual historic events because in their argument, the account is figurative. And so the days of creation may represent long geological periods of time. Creation week could, could be understood as a figurative expression for gradual changes which took place over millions upon millions of years in deep time. Okay, so that's the second view. I would say that's probably the, the, the most prevalent view among theistic evolution believers or non-creationist Christians. The third account, which is the minor account, believe it or not, is that it is literal history. Okay, those who hold to this view believe that Genesis 1, 1 to chapter 2, verse 3 is a literal description of how the cosmos came into existence. Okay, it describes a supernatural, literal creation week within 20, with 24 hour days. When it says the sun rose and the sun set day one, the sun, sorry, the sun set and the sun rose day two, there's no other way for me to interpret it than to say that this is 24 hour time span. <clears throat> because the earth, you know, the earth spins on an axis over 24 hours and that's how you get your sunrise and your sunset. You know, in fact, I, God could have created the universe in six minutes. Right? Or he could have created in six trillion years. But he chose, for whatever reason, in his own sovereign wisdom, he chose to do it over a little week. And I believe this establishes the calendar system with six days of labor and one day of work. In fact, if you go to Genesis chapter 20, I know Genesis, Exodus chapter 20 here, this is the Ten Commandments. And this is when God gives a the commandment about the Sabbath rest. <clears throat> Notice what he says. It says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. How are we to interpret that? <clears throat> in it you shall not do any work. 
You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Now, if it's not a literal day, sorry, I, I kind of missed the verse. I went, I went to verse 10. <clears throat> For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. If it wasn't six little days, man, that would be a long work week. If each day was equivalent to a million years, you'd never get to your Sabbath. You'd be dead before long, right? <laughs> or, you know, maybe you could Sabbath for a whole million years or whatever, right? So obviously, obviously we are to interpret that one literally, right? I mean, what's the point? It doesn't make any sense. You have a 24 Sabbath day, but the, all the other days are millions of years. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So anyway, we're not going to spend time on the first approach, the approach that's mythical, but we're going to evaluate the second approach. Okay, we're going to compare the figurative and literal views. So we'll end with, with, on this discussion. <clears throat> Just to say, there's a very interesting article in this book here. It's called Thousands, Not Billions. And one of the articles, and I'm, I'm borrowing a lot from this article, uh, yeah, from this article. One of the articles in here, it says a proper reading of Genesis chapter 1, 1 to chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, and he goes through a whole statistical analysis of the literary, uh, of the, of, of the uh, syntax of Genesis. <clears throat> and if you want it, I can send it to you by email. Just let me know. I'll photocopy it and send it to you by email, and you can read it for yourself. It's not that scientific. It's pretty easily, easily readable. But anyway... What this guy says, that through word, verb, and syntax analysis, it is possible to determine whether a text of scripture is poetic or historical narrative. You can do that. You know, if someone says, oh, it's poetic, well, how do you know that? Are you just saying it's poetic because you want it to be poetic, or are you saying it's poetic because it follows the, the syntax of poetic language? So biblical Hebrew uses specific grammatical forms and frequency of verb tenses for recording history. So for example, historical narrative texts, historical narrative would be things like Joshua, Judges, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Gospels, those are historical narr historic narrative texts. They show a noticeably high number of preterite verbs. Okay, preterite verb <clears throat> comes first in a sentence, describes an action, state, or condition. So historical narrative have a high number of verbs in them. In historical narrative, there are also distinct choices of language used, including verbs, which differ from language choices and verbs in poetic passages. So when comparing the linguistic features of historical narrative, like Joshua and Judges and the other ones that we're talking about, and poetic passages like the Psalms, when you compare these two, it becomes clear that the verb types are different. Verb types are more frequent in one literary type than in another. And so just by studying, doing the syntax, the syntactical analysis, you can determine what kind of literature it is. And so this guy did that. And what did he find? <clears throat> he found that, for example, Exodus 14 recounts the crossing of the Red Sea in narrative form and then you go to the next chapter, Exodus 15, the same event is, is recorded in poetic form. It's called the Song of Moses. It's the same thing. It's describing this exact same event, but using different language, using a poetic form. So if you study uh, Exodus 14, Exodus 15, I mean, even in English, you tell it's two different kinds of literary uh, types. So what's noticeable from these two accounts is that the ling in the linguistic features, verb forms and syntax structure differ significantly. I mean, you could read that. We don't have time to do it, but read uh, Exodus 14, and where the sea splits, and then read Exodus 15, where it's a song about how the sea split. Grammatical structures for ancient Hebrew pro poetry, such as parallelism, is frequent in the Psalms, but entirely absent in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. There is no parallelism, parallelism. 
In fact, linguistically, Genesis chapter 1 to 11 has a similar grammatical structure, word types and verb forms as Genesis 12 onwards, as most of Exodus and Joshua and Judges. So what, what are you saying? That if you do the analysis of the syntax of Genesis 1 and 2, you come to the conclusion that it is historical narrative. It's an account of something that happened in history. You can't say it's figurative. I mean, they can say it's figurative, but they're not being honest to the actual nature of the, of the, of the genre. So Genesis 1-1 and up to Genesis 2-3 falls in the category of historical narrative. Just like Joshua, just like Judges, just like Kings, so we would interpret those books in the same way. Now, this doesn't mean that the Psalms and other forms of poetry don't record historical events. They, certainly they do, but they use different linguistic features and grammatical structure and choice of language are very dis different from the Genesis record. Okay, so basically what we have to say, whether we like it or not, what we have to say is that the linguistic features of the Hebrew text of Genesis 1 and 2 is narrative, historical narrative. There is no other way around it. So it has to be interpreted as historical narrative. So if anyone tells you, oh, it's poetic language, you say, ah, uh, uh, it's not poetic language because it doesn't read as poetic language. If it's figurative, you say, no, it's not figurative. It doesn't fall under the category of figurative language. So it always drives me nuts when I hear, you know, I mean, I was just listening to a podcast of a professor of Old Testament. She was talking about Genesis 1 and 2, and she was saying, well, it's all figurative. And I'm thinking, like, you are an Old Testament prof. You know you're Hebrew. Why are you saying that? I don't even know the Hebrew is nearly as well as she does. Well, you say that because that's what you have to say if you don't believe it's literal. Okay, so the creation account is, in fact, describing events as historical. I guess what we can say is we can debate whether it's an accurate account of history or not. I mean, that would be the debate we'd have to have. It's, we can't debate what kind of literature it is. We know it's historical narrative. The debate then is, well, maybe it's not an accurate historical narrative. That's a different debate, okay? So this suggests that the creation account is describing events as historical, and therefore it's describing the events that God created everything in six literal days. That's how you have to interpret this. You have to interpret this historical narrative. So then the question is this, does this contradict the facts of science? Well, that's gonna be the topic of next week's discussion. But I'll tell you right off the bat, the reason why I am a creationist, not only because the Bible teaches creationism, I'm a creationist because the science doesn't support macroevolution. Okay? Yeah, as you know, I did a degree in science. I did four years of biomedical sciences. I studied, you know, every time you're in biology class, you're hearing the whole doctrine of evolutionary theory. So I had to sort it out. I was just a new Christian. I was reading Genesis. I said, these, these two accounts are in conflict here. What's going on? So I had to sort this out. And I'm thankful for, you know, some very intelligent and qualified uh, men of God, a Christian a creation scientists, PhD guys, and I read their stuff and I said, okay, okay, I get this. So I am a creationist because macro evolution, and we're gonna get this next week, there's two kinds of evolution, micro evolution and macro evolution. There is no scientific evidence whatsoever for macro evolution. Tons of evidence for micro evolution, ah, I mean, we can't deny that. But macroevolution has no evidence. So for scientific reasons, I'm a creationist, not only for biblical reasons. We'll end it there. Any, any questions or any? I got a, a, a question. <clears throat> Could you expand on God determines our destiny? <clears throat> All right, so I, I believe in general categories. I believe there are two destinies for every human being. You either are gonna be destined to be with God forever or destined to be separated from God forever. Those are established by God. So we are one of those two destinies. 
<clears throat> so in that sense, it's, they're predetermined destinies. Okay. Totally understand. <clears throat> I was thinking of it a different way. So. Yeah. So the wonderful thing is, is that we can change the destiny we're heading into, right? I mean, I, I was heading into the destiny to hell. Thank God I didn't die before. I, I accepted the Lord. <clears throat> so we can change our destiny from on the road to hell to the road to heaven, right? By accepting Christ. And again, I, know I didn't mention this last week, is that we can't go back. Once you're on the road to eternal life with the Lord Jesus, he secures that destiny for us, right? We don't fall back into the, into condemnation. <clears throat> I think, uh... Exactly. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned when we first come to how Christ will also, I'm going to paraphrase it, give reference to God as well, come down and reference with us. Sorry, can you repeat that again? You said, you mentioned that Christ would come from, from the right side of God and come down and reference God. You mean he'll be in subjection to God? Yeah. Yeah. So, he'll be at the right hand of the Father right now. From what we, from what we understand is the Spirit, the Father, the Son of God. So how would the Son... Well, we also learn... <coughs> excuse me. We also learn... That the Father never is the Son, and the Son is never the Father, and the Son is never the Spirit, and the Spirit's never the Son, and you know, that there's distinct, even though it's one God, it's three distinct persons. So the Son is always the Son. And eventually, there's something in Corinthians, I can't remember where it is, but there is in Corinthians that eventually the Son hands over everything to the Father, and even he himself submits to the Father. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're one in one in substance, right? Like, like I said, we, I don't understand the Trinity, right? <clears throat> the, the, but there's three. The Bible teaches there's three distinct persons in the Godhead: one God, three persons. And, and again, it's like the, the only can, the only thing that even in my mind can even not doesn't even fully approach, but can approach to some extent, is light. Because remember, we talked about light as two distinct forces. It's an electric force and then the magnetic force. The magnetic force is completely distinct on its own than the electric force. But when the two are together, you get light. And you cannot have light without electromagnetic force united together. So that's kind of how I see it, is that the Godhead is three, is, is, consists of three persons. One substance, light is the one substance with two forces. God is the one substance in three persons. Don't, don't understand it beyond that, I, you know. But that's what the Bible teaches, is that you have three. So, so the Son is always the Son. And as a Son, he submits himself to the Father. <clears throat> so I, I don't know where that verse is. Maybe if I had my cell phone and... Where's my cell phone? Oh, here it is. I can Google it. No. Jody will find it. It's like, the, it says like something to the extent that the son hands over everything to the father. Uh, it's in the New Testament. <clears throat> and then he himself is subject to the father. It's in Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken. First or second? <clears throat> there you go. First Corinthians fifteen twenty four. First Corinthians fifteen twenty four. Oh. Well, <laughs> I guess my Google is a little faster than yours. I don't know. First Corinthians fifteen twenty four. <clears throat> so. Uh, you know, it's talking about the, the order of resurrection. And then it says, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, 
to the God and Father when he had abolished all rule and all authority and all power. So he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy that will be abolished is death. And then verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God will be all in all. So even there in verse 28, it talks about how the son will also subject himself to the father <clears throat> when he hands over all things to the father. Don't understand, but still the, the, the one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. 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 Good question. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so like, for example, look at all the different types of dogs we have. They're all dogs, different types of cats. So that's all microevolution, right? It's just variation within a particular kind. So that, yeah, I mean, if, if anyone denies that, then yeah, they're, they're a science denier. But there's tons of evidence for that, microevolution. But to say that, you know, uh, an aquatic animal eventually became a land animal, they went from having gills to having lungs. You know, there is no evidence whatsoever for any of that kind of evolution. Yeah, there is, there's just no evidence for it, for macroevolution, for going from one particular kind to another, from a, you know, all the different kinds of dogs are still dogs. All the different kinds of cats are still cats. There is no evidence whatsoever for the vertical kind of evolution where you go from a small cell to, you know, multicellular to organism to whatever, right? <clears throat> and if monkeys started walking out of the forest as humans, why aren't they still doing it? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, you know, that, that's why Macroevolution just doesn't, is not a scientific theory. It is a theory based on a naturalistic worldview. So in other words, if you don't believe in God, you have to come up with some theory as to how to explain all that there is, right? So, you, so what happens if you read, I remember, you know, you read in the paper, oh, if evidence found for evolution, right? And so you read it, and it's always evidence for microevolution, right? I mean, you read it, and it's, well, no, that's not evidence for macroevolution. It's evidence for micro. So they take the evidence for microevolution and, and extrapolate it into the camp of macroevolution, right? You can't do that. That's, that's not being honest. That's totally dishonest. But if you don't know the difference... <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's the thing, is you have to really have your antennas tuned into this kind of... And, and again, that's why I say for scientific reasons, I, I have rejected the evolutionary theory. Any other questions? I know this is a little different than what we covered in the past, but... I get excited about this stuff, because this was my world, you know, decades ago. But. Well, if there's no other questions, then we'll, we'll close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much that you are so powerful. You call into things, you call into existence things which don't exist. You command and it stands fast. <clears throat> you even can, can remove what's in existence. You can call it into non-existence. Lord, you are so powerful and we just don't comprehend how powerful you are. But let us not bring you down to our level of understanding, Lord, elevate us to a higher level. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that your word is true, that it's reliable. That even though there's all these different narratives to the contrary, we, we do know, Lord, that you, your word is true. And I just pray that you would help us, Lord, to 
discover that truth. <clears throat> and let, let us be truth seekers, Lord. There's so little of that going on these days. Lord, there's just so little truth seekers and, and, and even, even truth itself is, is lacking in the uh, marketplace of ideas. Lord, make us truth seekers that we would be determined to understand what is the truth in whatever we hear. Just like the Bereans that said they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they tested everything. Here, the Apostle Paul comes into Berea, preaches the gospel, and they say, well, we want to test this. They were even testing whether Paul's words were true. Lord, let us be like Bereans, always testing things by the standard of your word. So Lord, as we go our separate ways, may you go with us. And, and Lord, that we would see you at work throughout this week. Pray these things in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen.